Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Those that are watching online, glad to have you there. Let us know who you are, where you're watching from. Glad to have you with us this morning. Y'all ready today? Are you? What a day. What a beautiful day it is. Welcome to the month of April. Can you believe it? Some of y'all are in church today because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Y'all are like, I don't know. The world might end. I'm going to go to church tomorrow. (laughs) Y'all been watching this, all the eclipse and everything. Y'all are like, help me, Jesus. Y'all are getting right with the Lord. There'll be all y'all getting baptized today just in case (laughs) you forgot about it. You're going to dive in. Just listen. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. It it is amazing what's going on in our world right now. I think God's rattling the cages. God's ringing the bells. God's just saying, and and you know, the the, the southerner in me says, well, it might just be nothing. But the, the Christian, the believer in me says, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Tomorrow's going to be one of those kinds of days, uh, April the 8th. Y'all know that all that's going on and that kind of thing. There was an earthquake in, uh, right at New York City this last week, 4.8 magnitude. I saw a video. I've got a friend in the Bronx who runs a ministry up there, and he contacted us and said, man, the ground just shook beneath our feet. It hadn't done that. And that was a, the strongest quake they had had in, I think, 120 or 140 years, something like that. I, I, God is at work. There's something going on. That, well, it's going on in the nation of Israel and all that's happening over there right now. And the, the vacillation that we're having with the, uh, the American support of, of Israel and all of that. There's a lot going on. Brothers and sisters, be praying. God is still on his throne. Amen. No matter what, we trust in God. April is a great month. So welcome to the month of April. I can't believe it's already April. Today's going to be a good day here. We are going to feed your soul Till your, your soul is full before you walk out of this room. And then outside, I, I guess, am I right? The food trucks are here today. I, did, did it, are they there yet? They'll be here. Uh, what we do, for those of you that don't know, is once a month we bring food trucks here and put them in the lot to support a local business. So before you guys leave, if you would, stop by, get some lunch and eat something for that. It's also a baptism today. We've got about 20 or 25 people that are scheduled to be baptized this morning. And, you know, we put the heaters in and we ran the heaters all night long. And you know what? They didn't work. <laughs> it cold, cold. It cold, cold out there. It's, it's cold. There's going to be some slippage and some shrinkage, but you'll have a good time. It'll be all right. It's, just enjoy yourself and tell yourself that Jesus was baptized in Jordan and it was cold too, so it'll be fun. But it, just to let you know, it, it is going to be a little, chi- <laughs> a little chilly. We got it, though. We got it, though. Matter of fact, today would be a good day for me to let the young associate do it by himself. (laughs) Next Sunday, if those of you that have children, you've been asking about this, the infants and baby dedication is going to be next Sunday. It's one of my favorite services. We bring the families, the children, they bring them all up here on the platform, and we speak a blessing over their life at one time. So if you have any infants or children up to around the age of six, seven, eight or something, bring them next week. The following week after that, on the 21st, is a celebration of our 39th anniversary as a church. We always try to remember to celebrate that because it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty large day. Uh, so don't miss any of that. Lots of stuff going on. We're glad that you're here. I'm glad that you came this morning. This morning, I want to follow up uh, with everything that happened on Resurrection Sunday with hopefully some revelation. You know, I tell you from time to time, it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose. Today's going to be one of those days. There's just a lot that I want to give you. If you have your Bible, open it with me to Genesis chapter 2. I'm also in no hurry this morning. I'm just going to wait on the Lord and let that sun get a little higher in the sky. (laughs) Warm that pool up a little bit more. Bless him, Jesus. Before I lay this out... um, And this is why I say I'm truthfully not in any hurry because I've got a a framework that I need to build here. I want to go back and lay some framework for the word that I'm I'm going to give you. About 14 years ago, on August the 10th, 2010, that far back, August the 10th, 2010, right here, it was near the end of what many people called the Great American Recession that happened from 2007 until around 2011, somewhere in, in that parameter, the Great American Recession. 
I happen to have preached then on the same subject that I'm going to preach on here this morning, not the same one, but the same way. A few weeks ago, when I started feeling this kind of stirring around in my spirit, uh, I've told you that I've kept all of my notes all the way back to 1991. So I went back to find that sermon and I, and I found it because I wanted to see what I had said then and what the conditions were that were surrounding that time, what brought me to that place to bring that word. And when I found those notes, I was amazed at just how similar the circumstances were then to what they are right now. I was, I was taken aback by it, to say the least. Solomon was right. When Solomon said there is no new thing under the sun, he, he was right. There is no new, it's just cycles. It just continues to swirl. 14 years ago, I was in my own life going through a lot of serious personal challenges at the time, 10 years ago or 14 years ago, life, family, home, church, business, uh, people, pretty much all of it, everything. And going through that had brought me to a place that I was just physically and emotionally spent. I, I was exhausted. I had nothing left in my life at the time. And my solution back then, I was a younger man, my solution back then was probably one that's pretty common, try harder. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on, try harder. It, your life is bad, try harder. Mm. And so I did, I tried harder. And I know that you understand what I'm talking about when I say that, but it brought me to a place of complete meltdown. Uh, a place in my own personal life where I had nothing left to give. I had nothing left in my tank. There were times, and, and, and I never said that publicly, but there were times in my life, and, and I'd written this down, where I just didn't even want to get out of bed in the mornings. Most of the time, I just wanted to just disappear. Anybody ever have a, a time like that where, you know, if I could, I'd just put my car on 95 and head north and y'all would never see my fat butt again. <laughs> that, that's how I felt and at the time. And in the swirl of all that, I went to God in prayer, as we all do, and, and my prayer was very simple. God, what in the world? Right? What in the world? And I expected something like, <laughs> oh, my son. <laughs> You wonderful child of mine, I love you so much. And this ain't nothing but the dang devil just hit. I just got you. You'll be all right. But I didn't hear any of that. And I prayed a lot. I prayed a lot. And, and, and what I finally heard was, do you really want to know? And I said, yes. And let me, let me bless somebody here because any time that I have ever been in a season like that in my life, God has catapulted me into a, in a whole different thing than I ever believed was possible. Wednesday night, May the 2nd, 2001, I was at the end of an eight-year depression, and, and I was praying like that, and God said, do you really want to know? And when he told me, it took my life to a whole different level. So if, if God ever asks you, do you really want to know, don't hesitate, say yes. Amen. Yes, I, I want to know. Tell me what I need to hear. Fourteen years ago, the Holy Spirit spoke into my life at that difficult season and said, listen to this, this is what he said, you need to know what to do on the eighth day. I had no idea what that meant. And so he led me at the time and took me to the Genesis narrative, and I want to read that with you, if you will. Genesis chapter 2, if you wouldn't mind, stand please with me in honor of reading God's Word. Genesis chapter 2, the honor of His Word. Verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth and all of the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The rest of the Genesis narrative is just that, that from that moment on, as you know, God then carried on. After that day of rest, there was something else. Planted a garden. He put man in it. He created Eve from the rib of Adam and brought her to him. From there on, the story just went. So from that Simple narrative. I want to just talk to you this morning for a few minutes on, on a subject that's going to require your uh, a bit of attention to, to, to hear what I'm saying. I want to talk to you this morning about the eighth day, what that means and how that works in your life. The eighth day. Some of you right here this morning are standing at your seventh day and you don't even know it. 
Some of you are longing for an eighth day, and you don't even know it. Some of you are at a point where God's going to do something on the eighth day that is going to catapult your life in ways that you never dreamed possible. The enemy is mad. God is at work. All hell may be breaking loose, but it's all right. It's never been better. It's never been more fine. Father, let this word today be lamp to feet, light to path, breaking chains and pulling down strongholds, opening blinded eyes and setting the course of our destiny for the next season. Thank you for a word in due season. And they said together, amen. amen. Woo, you may be seated. Anyone who knows much about the Bible knows that obviously the creation story is told there in the book of Genesis and that the first five words of the Bible are, in the beginning, God created. From there, the story is laid out and told in, in increments. It's told as it goes day by day. Before we get to the day by day right there in verse 2, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Word of God says that the earth, as you remember from Sunday school, was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. It's a much deeper study than you can do in five minutes on a Sunday morning, but what the imagery is conveying here is that during this creation process, during the creation process, that what surrounded that process was confusion and darkness and emptiness. There was chaos. It was disturbing. It was messy. It, it was not clean. It was, it was a messy operation that was going on there. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God moved over all of that. Now, some translations say, as, as I recall, that the Spirit of God hovered. I'm a, I, was, I was raised on King James language. I like that better. Uh, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. That word literally means to brood, to brood. Beyond that, it means to ponder it to think about, to dwell on a subject, listen, with persistence. Leave that there and, and someone think about what that means. That the Spirit of God in that moment was hovering there over all of that in that moment. It is a very intentional act that, listen, is palpable with purpose. Something is happening right there. And if you were there, you, would, you, would, you may not know what was happening, but you would have a recognition something is happening here. Because on this, on this one hand, there is this, all this confusion and chaos and foolishness that's going on and things are happening. But, it, but on the other hand, there is perfection. Perfection is hovering over my chaos. And so chaos in that moment is intersecting with perfection. And any time chaos intersects with perfection... When you put all of that together in context, what it tells us is several things that we, need to really, we really need to know about God. Number one is that we need to know that God is a God of order. God is a God of order. And that confusion, darkness, chaos, and emptiness cannot stay where he is. And so what that means is that if at some time you've got chaos and emptiness and confusion going on in your life most of the time, most of the time what that is is an indication that your adversary is at work and probably prevailing in that moment. And your greatest need in that moment is to actively invite in God into that situation. Because the natural result of God's presence, let's not miss that, let me say it a different way, the powerful result of God's presence there is that He will, by His presence, clear the confusion, light up the darkness, and fill every empty space with Himself. So that's a beautiful thing. So that if you've got that stuff going on, what's your greatest need to do is to pray, God, I need you to come here. I need you involved in this situation, knowing that when he gets there, chaos will intersect with perfection and God will then clear up all of that confusion. He will light that darkness. He will then fill every space with himself. That's why at this point in my life, I'm older now, I no longer get concerned when craziness starts happening in my life. Can I bless some young people here this morning? Stop getting concerned when craziness starts happening in your life. 
I no longer get worried about it when it starts happening in my life, in the world, in the church, because I've, I know this now. I don't need to work it out. I don't need to figure it out. I don't need to fight it out. I don't need to fix it. What I need to do is pray. And when I pray, I actively invite, y'all ain't clapping because y'all don't pray. Those eight people were people who pray. They know what I'm talking about. When you invite God into that place through prayer, his presence will have the same effect in your life as it did there in the book of Genesis. He will light that darkness. He will clear up that confusion and he will fill the space with himself. And that's what you need. So number one, I feel good today. Kathy was nice to me this morning. Don't happen very often, but today it was a good day. Point number one, God is a God of order, not confusion. Point number two, the Genesis narrative shows us, now listen to this, that the beginnings of things can be and usually are chaotic. The beginning of things can be and usually are chaotic. That needs to be understood because the relevance of what I just spoke into your life is incalculable. Because what that means is that sometimes as you are standing on the threshold of some amazing new thing, whether it be a new day, a new season, a new relationship, a move of God, a breakthrough in your life, it can be extremely confusing. New beginnings are not always like a Hallmark movie. Sometimes new beginnings are everything but. They are completely Crazy. We think sometimes when God says, listen, behold, I do a new thing. The uneducated, the unlearned go, hey, goody. Yeah. <laughs> we think choirs are going to sing. Angels are going to appear. Stars are going to line up. Doors are going to open. We're going to get goosebumps all over the place. And it's all going to make sense on the contrary. Right. My experience has been. That what often happens is that in the, the very beginning stages of any new thing, there is a complete chaotic rush of activity as hell is fighting you all every step of the way. And heaven is doing everything that it can to bring you to that place of trusting God, even when hell is fighting you through that beginning. See, don't misunderstand this. You, you may be right now thinking something great's about to happen in my life. Then why is hell breaking loose? Ding, ding. Right there. Beginnings can be and usually are confusing. Lastly, number three. The creation moment recorded in Genesis lets us know that the plans and purposes of God in the lives of his people never just happens. But it is, in fact, all a part of a process that goes all the way back to before you were ever born. Before you were in your mother's womb. All of it goes all the way back there. And that process that God is using to get you to the place in life where you're supposed to be to fulfill the purpose of God that you're supposed to fulfill in your life is all a part of the process that is, in my opinion, typified here in creation in the beginning of the Bible. It's actually one of the most powerful moments in all of the Bible. So let's walk through it together. Day one through six, God begins to create. Let there be light. There, there be clouds and sun and moon and stars. Let there be living creatures and the living creatures all appears. Day one through six. On day six, God said, let us create man in our image. And then on the seventh day, you find a notation that God rested from his labor, that God rested. Now, the, the literal rendering of that word rested means that he stopped, he rested, he put it down, and he celebrated. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but that's not how I think about God. That on the seventh day, the Bible says God rested. I always said, okay, that just means he rested. No, it means he stopped, he rested, he put it down, and he celebrated. I don't know how God celebrates, but it's got to be good. <laughs> he celebrated, which is not an image. Now, now so, so focus because I want to build something. In this creation story, days one through six are a representation of life. It represents the effort that goes into the creation of life. I don't know if y'all have lived long enough to know this yet, but sometimes you're going to find it out that life ain't always easy. We don't always walk around with horseshoes and rainbows and unicorns. It's, it's, life is hard. Life can be hell sometimes. It is, it's real. Day one represents beginning. The beginning of anything is always exciting, as it very well should be. Days two through six, listen, Trying to build this. Represent the implementation of order, structure, 
placement of it all and how it works. Days two through six represent how this all goes together. This goes here and does that. That goes there and does that. This is the order and the structure of it all together. And then on day seven, the Bible says that it's all about rest, which is a revelation that, that could change your life and that all of us need, that God says to you all and to me included, that rest has a place in your life. Never feel guilty when you sit down. Never feel guilty. Now, don't stay there, but don't feel guilty when you take a minute and catch your breath. I'm not going to waste much time on it because you already know that it's true that we all need to learn that, especially those church folks who seriously want to serve God. If you're one of the people that loves God and you seriously want to serve Him with all of your heart, you need to learn what rest means. Because far too often our lives are lived in this rush of go, 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 go. Do more, do more. Try harder, work harder. You love God, do more. Yeah. 14 years ago, I was living that life. Go, 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 go. And it brought me to a place of a crash. I thought I was stronger than that. You're not. I was literally functioning in dysfunction. I hope you hear me. I was burned out. I was worn out. I was empty. On the, on the verge of a complete collapse. And while I was in that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke into my life and said those words. And I'm saying them to you again. You need to learn what to do on the eighth day. And again, I had no idea what that meant. So I went into a study of biblical numerology. Little did I know it would become a lifelong passion for me. You know, in the Bible, when you see numbers, they, they, they mean something. It's not, God never just does something. God, there's always something in there. That's why people who read the Bible to go to sleep, I don't know how you do it. I can't. I read the Bible and I wake right up. I'm going after something. Number one, the number one always represents beginning. It represents unity and sovereignty. Day one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The number two represents difference or division, the place of something or someone else, the number two. Number three represents completion and perfection. When you see the number three in your Bible, it represents completion and perfection. He was risen again on the third day. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The, the three-four chord is not easily broken. Four represents creation. Five represents grace. Six is representation of imperfection, the number of man. That's, when you see the number six, it represents who we are. We are not perfect. Number seven is always used as a representation of perfection. It is the number of God. Seven. The number eight, I found out that the number eight, and I feel silly saying it now because it's so common to me now, but 14 years ago, I hadn't heard this. Eight is used to indicate a new day. The beginning of a new season. A fresh start, a new era, and this word, I love that word, the word is next. And what I figured out in my caveman mind 14 years ago is that the Spirit of God was saying to me in that moment of my life when I was trying harder and harder and harder, He was saying, you need to know what to do next. Because until a person understands what to do next, you will always be satisfied with now. I'm going to preach before I get out of here. It's not, always, it's not always a bad thing to be in a now, but sometimes you can get stuck in a now that is holding you to, from keeping you from getting to your next. Along the way, you can learn this, that God can open a door to you to day one of a new season, but if you just stand there and look at it, you will never step into it. I'm going to say that again because y'all didn't hear what I said. God can open to you the door to a new season. But if you just stand there and look at it because you are afraid or you are familiar with where you are, where you always will be is at one day instead of day one. There's a difference between one day and day one. Watch this. After his crucifixion, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, what we see is all of the disciples hiding and broken. Caught up in now, not knowing what to do next. That's so good. you never seen it like that. That's, that's how it was. They were caught up in now, not knowing what to do next. 
This is how my mind works. It makes me wonder how much different would the world be and how much different if, would the church be if they had just stayed there? If they had just said, oh, you know what? He's dead. It's done. We're over. There's nothing left. It's finished. We're done. How much different would the world be? How much different would the church be if they had done that? But his resurrection was the beginning of a new season. And here's a little bit of Bible stuff in case y'all didn't know this. He was resurrected not on the seventh day. He was resurrected on the eighth day. Y'all going to fact check me. 20 of y'all go, I always heard it was, no, it's the eighth day. That's when he was resurrected. The idea of the eighth day is rooted in the reality. Listen to this. Great crisis often follows great moments and great moments often follow great crisis. That's what the eighth day, the idea of the eighth day is rooted in that reality that great crisis often follows great moments. So if you're having a great moment, <laughs> hang on because it's also true that sometimes great crisis is going to follow a great moment. One of the best representations of that is 1 Kings chapter 17, where we find the story of Ahab, Elijah, Jezebel, and Mount Carmel. <laughs> Sunday school. Just after Elijah calls down fire from heaven. Y'all. If I called down fire from heaven, I'd be on TBN this afternoon. I'd be like, yeah, I did it. I called fire. That's why God's never let me call fire down from heaven. <laughs> I'd just be randomly calling it down. That guy right there. Whoosh. Just after he calls down fire from heaven, Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. And he runs off into the desert. Y'all know the story. And he wants to die. What in the world? He had a great moment that was followed by a great crisis. He knew, as many of us know, what to do in extreme moments. We know what to do when there's an adversary. That doesn't catch us by surprise, but many times we don't know what to do. Listen, I'm, I'm trying to help you when there is not a crisis. The eighth day can be a turning point after great challenges, but very often what it is is, listen to your pastor, just a regular day. I hope y'all are getting this. Listen, thankfully, we have more regular days than we have extreme ones. You do. You have more regular days than you have. What is a regular day? On a regular day, I'm not fighting a giant. I'm not, I'm not fighting a devil. I'm, I don't have some great thing going on. There is no great crisis going on in my life. I'm, I'm not sick. And so in that day, what is required of me? Christians need to learn this. I need to know how to do the necessary things. See, most of us know what to do when, the, when, the, when there's a fight going on. We fast, we pray, we seek God, we go after the scripture. But when there's just a regular day going on, what do we do? We read the word. We pray. We seek God. We worship him. We submit ourselves to him. You are doing Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly. With <laughs> you know, this sounded better to me in my study than it does out here, but I'm going to preach it anyway. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the eighth day is just a regular day. But sometimes the eighth day does come along after you have been knocked down. After you have been let down and hurt and disappointed and abandoned and betrayed and rejected, that eighth day comes around and now what you have to do in that day is that it's time for you to quit being in a place of pity. It's time for you to get up and get moving again. That's what the eighth day represents. It's time. Some of you, you just need to shake that off. It's time. Somebody say out loud, it's time. See, I've spent the last few weeks, at least last week, thinking about this. Jesus rose from the grave on the eighth day. I didn't shout enough about that last Sunday, so I'm going to do some more today. I'm gonna, the eighth day is the day that Jesus showed them and us that it is not 
over, even when everything tells you that it is over. On the morning of the eighth day, they went to the tomb to find him, and the angel said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here. Go and tell everyone about it. He is not here. The eighth day reminds us, and I'm trying to remind somebody that no matter what it is, it's not over when hell tells you it is over. It's not over when the devil tells you it is over. Somebody help me. It's not over when CNN and Fox News tells you it's over. It's not over because God is still God and with God all things are possible. It's not over even though I've been knocked down. How many of you have ever been knocked down to your knees before? Every time you get knocked to your knees, you ought to thank God for it because all the devil did was put you in the right position to pray. And so I'm going to pray while I'm on my knees and invite God into that dark situation and watch what happens when chaos comes into perfection. <laughs> Hallelujah. The eighth day represents victory that is waiting for those people who will press on even when you don't want to. How many of y'all have ever looked at your ugly mug in the mirror and said, I'm going to quit. I ain't going to do it anymore. I'm not even, I'm done trying. This week, several times this week, come on. I'm done with you. Okay. Talking to yourself. I'm done with you. Even when you face, it represents those days. The eighth day represents those days. Listen, I'm, I'm talking to somebody. After your life crashes, after your life falls apart, the day after they have repossessed your car, the day after you've lost a battle or two, the, the, the day after your insurance company told you no. I, I, I almost got in my flesh right then. I almost said I hate insurance companies. That's not true. I despise insurance companies. <laughs> hate is too nice a word. It comes after your spouse has walked out and your children fell. Anybody ever been in a season like that? Yeah. You just don't know what other hell can come at you because you've already had all of it that you can stand. Let me tell you what. I'm, that's when you stand in your shower and cry. The shower is the best place for you to cry because no one else can see your tears. <laughs> Stand in your shower and cry. But here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to wash my face. I'm going to dry my tears. I'm going to put on my best outfit. And I'm going to walk out acting like God has done something for me. Right out of that thing and right into my eighth day. I'm going to step into it. I may look the same. But everything about me says this is a new season. This is a new day. I need to tell someone that you can have an eighth day any day. You can have one today. Just go home tonight and sit down at your dinner table. Get you a piece of cheesecake. I don't care if you're on a diet. Get you a, the whole cheesecake pie. Put it on the table. Eat you a couple of slices of it and just say, you know what? Pastor said this is my eighth day, so I'm going to say amen and celebrate. Today is my eighth day. You, yeah, you got knocked down. Okay, yeah, you got knocked down. Now here's your, here's your dad saying, now get back up. You've been down long enough. People are tired of hearing your downtown story. Get up and get moving again. You've got to. Yes, I've suffered a loss. But today's a new day. Standing. I've done it. Whew. Stood in a shower. Dry your tears. And walk out saying, I trust in God. Yes, it looks bad. Yes, it still looks bad. But God is good. Amen. The eighth day represents continuing to do what you need to do to ensure the fact that you will have a future. Amen. You need to keep doing the necessary things that will ensure that you will have the blessing of God and step into your future. Don't let the devil convince you that this is the end of it. This is your now and this, there is no next. It's a lie. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2 says, On the first day of the week, which is by, by the way, the eighth day, the scripture says, Let every one of you lay up in store as God has prospered him. Is he going to talk about giving? Oh, yeah. 
in this ridiculous era that we are in right now, buckle in, of build back better, nothing is built, nothing is back, and nothing is better. And it's not going to change. I declare, and I want you to declare with me that Washington is not my source. Washington is not the one who's going to get me out of this. God is forever going to be my source. And I declare it today that on the first day of the week, I'm going to put my gift. I'm going to put my tithe. I'm going to put my offering. I'm going to plant my seed. And that means there is a harvest in my future. Where's all my givers at? Say amen. Don't lie. I should have said, where's all the tithers at? Three people. In the Hebrew language, and I'm going to try to finish this because I'm tired of my own preaching. (laughs) In the Hebrew language, the number eight, look it up, fact check me, I know you will, comes from a root word that literally means to (laughs) superabound. True story. It comes from a root word that means to superabound. Which means that I'm not just going to abound. I'm going to superabound. Yeah. Is there anybody else in this room besides me want a superabound season? Yeah. I want a superabundance in my life. I want a superabound. That's what the eighth day means. And so when you say, I'm going to step into the eighth day, the eighth day is all of that. It is a new season. It is a new day. It is the beginning of next. But it's also a statement that you will step into a time of superabundance. Yeah. I will superabound. The eighth day is a new day. And I'll finish with this if I can. In Leviticus, it is recorded. I want to get this right. It is recorded that it took seven days to consecrate the priests. Seven days to consecrate the priests. Read it. It's a fascinating thing. They dipped... Their fingers in blood and they rubbed blood on the ear. They rubbed blood on the thumb and they rubbed blood on the toe. Which means a lot of things, but one of the things that it was meant to to represent is that it covered the totality of who a person was. Through your ears, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. That's where you put the helmet of salvation on. The thumb, the foot, it encompasses the the totality of who they were. It was a consecration process. To consecrate meant to set apart as holy. So the consecration process of the priests was an ongoing seven-day process. It took seven days to consecrate them, meaning that God wanted this process to, to set them apart so that they would be filled with the Spirit of God, to be filled with the purpose of God, to be filled with the eighth day. It was God's intention that when they then emerge from that consecration, I know what I'm going to say, so I'm excited you're not. But when they emerge from that consecration process, they would then carry on the work of God. That's what that was all about. Maybe you've never heard this, but it was a regular part of that process that when they would emerge from that consecration process after seven days, that on the eighth day, God himself would manifest his presence there to them, with them, in that tribe and in that community. He manifested his presence on the eighth day after they had gone through the consecration process to set themselves apart to be holy and serve God with their life. I want to say to you this morning, church, lest you forget, you are a chosen generation. Royal priesthood. You don't see royalty when you look in your mirror, but you are. You don't see royalty when you get mad in traffic and throw someone a finger. You don't see it, but you are. You are a chosen generation. Royal priesthood. His own special people. That you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 
God's intention for us is the same as it was for them, that as we emerge from the consecration process, whatever that process would be in your life, the picture is then that we can expect His presence. I live every day of my life expecting His presence expecting his presence I'm never let down I'm never let down I'm expecting his presence and his presence appears have you ever just been sitting in your car by yourself singing a song on the radio and suddenly you feel the manifest presence of God in your car there's nothing like it nothing like it to be in a store and some foolishness is going on and your flesh wants to just launch on somebody but you suddenly feel the manifest presence of God. As God says, you see what they're doing but I know what they've been through. So give them the grace that I've given you. The manifest presence of God comes on the eighth day. The eighth day. The eighth day represents starting over. And you can have an eighth day any day. You can have an eighth day today. You can have an eighth day tonight. You can have an eighth day tomorrow. You can have an eighth day any day. God, I'm claiming my eighth day. 14 years ago, I was so burnt out. And God said, you need to learn what to do on the eighth day. And I've learned what to do on the eighth day. I've learned. When the devil starts showing his butt like he does, craziness starts happening. And always in my life, there's some kind of craziness going on. I don't need to figure it out. I don't need to work it out. I don't need to fight it out. I don't need to straighten anybody out. Y'all ought to hear what I'm saying. I just need to pray. God, I need you. Come on over. I need you here. When God shows up, chaos <laughs> bows to perfection. God lights up the darkness, clears up the confusion, and fills that empty space with himself. <laughs> Woo! And what happens on the eighth day? That's the beginning of a new... Y'all hear what I'm saying? It's the beginning of a new season. This is, this is something I'm excited myself. I'm baptizing people today. That is the beginning of a new season. That's your eighth day. You can claim the eighth day right now. Matter of fact, when I'm done, I, I might get somebody to baptize me. Now let me just do it again. It's my party. I can do it if I want to. I, you can have an eighth day. You can have an eighth day any day. Maybe you want to baptize me? No, she said no. The eighth day. I preach stuff like this from time to time, and you never know what that means to somebody. I talked to somebody this week, might be watching. Made a huge mistake, horrible mistake. Horrible mistake. You can have an eighth day. You can start over. You can start over. You can start over. You can have an eighth day today. You can start over. It's the beginning of a new season. Married couples, you need an eighth day every day. That wasn't meant to be cute, but, but it's true. You, you need an eighth day every day. Start over. You maybe, I don't know, maybe y'all came in here this morning and y'all still mad at one another over last night's meatloaf. I don't know. I don't know. But you know, don't let that stay like that. Start over. Start over. Do it again. I'm so full this morning. I, if you touch me, you're going to get a dose of it. That this morning, so many of us, and I truly believe this, are standing on the threshold of your next. You're standing on the threshold of your next. And hell is having a fit. Having a fit. It may be manifesting in people at work around you. It may be your spouse. It may be your kids acting the fool. I don't know. It could be in your own mind. In your own mind, you're, you're, you're having crazy thoughts. Hell is fighting. 
Because why? You're standing on the threshold of something next. And whatever it is, is going to be super abundance, super abounding. It's going to put you in a place that you never thought you would be. No wonder hell's fighting you. No wonder. So at the beginning of every new thing, there can be extreme chaos. Extreme chaos. Today, I'm going to give an invitation for prayer. If that's you, you're standing on the threshold of something you, or you got complete chaos going on in your life. Find a place to pray and invite God. Actively invite God into that presence. And when you actively invite God into that presence, He will manifest His presence. He will light up the darkness, clear up the confusion, and fill that place with Himself. He will hover, the Scripture says, over that. Let's pray together. I'm just the delivery person. I trust God now to take this water and turn it into wine. Trust that God will manifest in your life this morning what you were brought here to hear. The pride will take a back seat in your life. The depression will take a back seat, bowing its knee before perfection, the presence of God. Presence of God, we invite you to come. Fill this place with yourself. Fill this place with your presence. Let somebody who did not think it was possible see that one more time, it is possible. You say, Pastor, I've started over so many times. Do it again, one more day, the eighth day. Start it again. I've made God so many promises. <laughs> He's still listening. He still loves you. The head's bowed and heart's open. In a moment, I'm going to give an invitation for prayer, and I'm just going to open wide the gates. Is that all right? <clears throat> I'm just going to open wide the gate so that there's. I'm not putting a fine point on anything. I'm just going to open wide the gate. Anybody who has a need to pray, you're welcome to come. If you're standing in a place of complete confusion and chaos right now and you're wondering what is going on, you're welcome to come and find a place to pray. If the attitude of your heart right now is that you recognize there's entirely too much apathy, indifference, and lukewarmness in your life, you've gotten to a place of lukewarmness even though you didn't mean to be, when I give this invitation, you should run, not walk to the altar and talk to God about that. If that is happening in your life, don't leave here thinking it'll get better, it'll change. It'll No, today the water is troubled. The opportunity to pray is now. If you came here this morning and you need to give your life to Jesus, Start a new day. You need to start in a new direction. When we give this invitation to pray, why don't you come find a place? Just open your heart to God. If your marriage is in a situation where it's not what it needs to be, pray. Invite God. Actively invite God into that. And for someone who's so discouraged, so discouraged right now, I feel that so discouraged. It's a new season. It's a new day. A fresh anointing is flowing your way. It's a season of power and prosperity. It's a new season coming to me. You didn't get anything else out of this. That's what you want to claim. I want to claim the eighth day, I want to claim a new season in my life, in my spiritual walk with God, in my marriage, in my family. I want to claim a new season as a father, as a husband, as a man. I want to claim a new season as a wife, as a woman, as a mother. I want to claim a new season in my parenting. I want to claim a new season in my life. In Jesus' name. The floodgates are open wide. The Spirit of God is here. Guys, if y'all would come, I want y'all to worship. If you wouldn't mind, all across the building, please stand. Those of you that are at home watching, let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know what God is saying to you right now in your life. Altar workers are ready to anoint and pray for you this morning. I'd love to see a good old-fashioned few minutes in His presence where we just pour out our hearts to God. God, this entire day was orchestrated for me.
This word was given to me. I need, I'm looking for, I'm longing for more of you. I want a new season, an eighth day. And I claim it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.